So thank you for uh, continuing to join me in this uh, module. In this module, we're going to discuss chemical and biological hazards. First of all, we'll discuss the classification and uh, health risks from hazardous substances, the assessment of health risks associated with each category, occupational exposure limits, what they mean and uh, how we, we can use them in the workplace, several control measures and solutions to mitigate exposure to uh, chemical and biological hazards. We're going to discuss some specific common uh, agents. And finally, we're going to discuss the safe handling and storage of waste. Now, if we want to, uh, to begin with classifying chemical agents according to their different forms, we start with the gases, so they spread through a container in 3D. They can be fumes, so it's a, cl a cloud of fine particles suspended in the air. They can be vapor, so fine particles supported by buoyancy or, or uh, movement of air or air currents. Mists, which is like droplets in the air near the ground. It could be a liquid, it could be a dust, which is like a fine powdery material, or they can even be a fiber, so it's like an elongated fine uh, particles. Different forms you can expect in the workplace. Now we can also categorize uh, chemicals according to their effect on the body. So we have, first of all, as you can see here in the um, in the code, uh, we have uh, very toxic and toxic chemicals. Uh, these can cause severe harm in small quantities. They can be even uh, fatal. The exposure to, that, to such chemicals sometimes can, can kill a person from a single exposure. They can be harmful, so they may cause death or chronic or acute ill health. They can be corrosive, uh, which basically means that it will burn or destroy living tissues, skin, or any uh, uh, other kind of uh, tissue. They can be irritant, they cause inflammation. They can be carcinogenic, causing or inducing cancer. Uh, and they can be a re reproductive uh, toxin, so affecting uh, fertility. They can affect even embryos. Um, if we have or if we employ uh, pregnant uh, women in the workplace. Now, chemicals can have, or they can affect our body in, in two ways. They can have an acute effect, meaning that the effect or the harm will be apparent immediately, will immediately start sneezing or coughing. If it's uh, skin that is exposed, it will be irritated or inflamed immediately. But the more riskier, really, type of exposure or effect is the chronic. The chronic uh, will take time, and it will uh, it will only like the effect or the harm will appear only after frequent and elongated exposure. So they have a, a long latent or hidden period, if we want to call it that. And a lot of occupational illnesses, occupational cancer, for example, happens in this way, uh, where um, the, the the victim or the person who is affected may not be immediately aware of the risk they are um, surrounded with. Um, so the, the effects can also be local, so it affects the site of first contact, if it's skin for example. And it can be systemic, so it can occur only after the substance has been absorbed and distributed in the body. It can affect other organs associated with it, like the, the blood, the, um, it could be the, the liver or the kidneys, for example. In terms of routes of entry, so there are several ways the chemicals can get into the body, or all agents really, any kind of harmful agent. So it can be contact with bare skin or eyes, so through the skin, like cement, causing chemical burns and dermatitis or skin inflammation. There is acids, chemical burns. It can also uh, happen through broken skin or a, a cut, for example. Examples of that include leptospira, tetanus, um, needle stick injuries or even high pressure fluids. If they are hazardous, they'll enter into the bloodstream immediately and they'll have a very quick impact on, on the health of the individual. There's also breathing in chemicals through inhalation. That's one of the most common uh, routes of uh, entry for uh, harmful agents because uh, breathing is a non-volunteer um, uh, activity, if you want to call it that. We can't stop breathing 
okay? So we can avoid touching a hazardous chemical or an item, um, but we can avoid digesting or ingesting like um, food or a, an item that is polluted, but we can't stop breathing really. Okay, so it's one of the most common uh, routes of entry of chemicals um, and this can allow agents like viruses, hepatitis, AIDS, influenza viruses uh, or harmful gases like carbon monoxide, etc. Fibers like asbestos can enter into the uh, respiratory system this way. Bacteria like Legionella, uh, dust for example, wood dust, cement, and silica as well. And as, as we can see here in the slide, we have a lot of examples because as I mentioned, it, it is one of the most, or it, it is actually the most common route of entry. There is also swallowing um, harmful agents. So ingestion, for example, chemicals, so food or water or even uh, plates or cups or uh, cutlery that is contaminated with harmful agents. Uh, again, bacteria can enter into the body this way, or parasites, etc. Now, if we want to assess health risks associated with um, these agents, we need to look at the hazardous properties, the information from the supplier or the manufacturer, the type and level and duration of exposure, how often and how long are the individuals exposed to this uh, agent, um, the situation, so the amount of substance in, involved and the concentration. The higher the concentration, the higher the risk. That's how it goes for most agents, really. The work activities, so what type of work? Are they working in a ventilated environment? They have proper welfare facilities? They have uh, proper um, t uh, working temperature and lighting? Or are they working in outdoors where there is extremes of temperatures? Uh, we don't have much control over ventilation, for example. We also need to look at the workplace exposure limit, which is um, a legal guidance or standard that will help us to balance between the concentration uh, of the material or the agent and the work duration. These go hand in hand as we will see in the upcoming slides. It's a mathematical equation or sometimes it's a table that we need to take into account when planning for work. Uh, the effects of uh, preventive and uh, control measures if, that we have in place. We'll also look at those in the upcoming slides. The results of health surveillance. So do we have a prevalent or very significant uh, rate of our workers exposed or experiencing harm from these agents or not? Of course, if it has been proven through um, medical and health surveillance, then we need to take a quicker action. It means that it's a big problem that we are facing. The results of monitoring exposure as well, so taking readings for the concentration of this material and how many people are exposed to it. Again, the more, the bigger the number of people we have exposed to it, the higher the risk. Um, combination of substances, so sometimes you have different agents, they react and produce an even uh, higher level of risk. Uh, the classification of biological agents, if we have any, or if, if we expect to have, especially in the medical and uh, healthcare sectors, and other information like the storage, the, um, the, the containers, uh, and what kind of storage system we have in place, and label, and etc. The sources of information that we can use in order to help us to uh, understand all of the factors we mentioned, uh, the most important source really is MSDS or Material Safety Data Sheet. All around the world now when we have proper management systems for uh, chemical agents or hazardous materials in general, it's a legal requirement to have an MSDS or a Material Safety Data Sheet. Usually it's like a label and it's placed on the container uh, or the vessel that contains these uh, kind of chemicals. In Oman, for example, I know that customs and civil defense have a very strong grip on what kind of chemicals enter, enter into the country. If an MSDS was not there, if label was missing, it will simply not be allowed into the country, which is, which is necessary, really. There's also the product labels containing the name, commercial, and um, uh, the lab or, or chemical um, components of this uh, material. Manufacturer's safety data sheet as well. The internet, nowadays, literally, you can find <laughs> details on any topic that you might uh, think of on the internet. However, we need to be careful that it's from a trusted and updated, relevant source of information. 
the databases on chemical substances, uh, government agencies, for example, the UK Health and Safety Executive. Again, in Oman, we have publications from civil defense and guidance that will help us, professional institutes and trade associations, and scientific journals and research professional bodies can also provide a lot of help in that regard. Now, the thing with the chemical monitoring is the limitations really is that it, it measures one specific chemical so at a time. So it doesn't give us an overall uh, assessment or evaluation of the situation, especially if we are using different and varied uh, concentrations and types of agents. Um, the good thing though, it is uh, quantitative, so there is a value, a number that is given. However, again, it does not measure interactions of many chemicals. We can't really um, anticipate how these chemicals are going to act together. It depends a lot on calibration of uh, measuring uh, equipment and tools. It depends on the operator training and where they take these readings. And it also depends on a representative sample. So what the, the concentration or the situation in one uh, site does not reflect the situation in others. So we need to be careful with these readings and sampling techniques because it needs to be as accurate and realistic as possible and that's a challenge sometimes. An example of monitoring um, tools or techniques is the use of uh, dust monitoring um, equipment. Uh, so using um, this uh, piece of equipment, we fix it into the coverall as we can see here in the picture. Um, it uh, collects um, uh, samples from uh, the dust, whatever kind of dust we can expect to have in that workplace. Uh, and then we can take the reading for analysis and it uses different uh, kinds of techniques as well. Now moving on to occupational exposure limits. When we discuss exposure limits, we are looking into it from two points of view. We look at it from the regular average uh, working hours, which is usually eight hours. And this is called time weighted average reading, TWA. Okay, this again is an international standard. If you go into the guidances, if you Google the ILO, International Labor Organization Standards and Guidance, you'll find it very similar because it's an inter international guide. So you'll find similar uh, standards and categories in the UK, in Oman, different parts of Europe, in the US. Because as I mentioned, it's an international standard. So it's, it's relevant and applicable in all, really, all around the world. So that's one part of it, the average working hour. And then we look at the 15 minute time weighted average. So this is the short term exposure. This is when we expect to have the individual carrying a, a small task really that is not, it's part of their work routine, but it doesn't form their whole work uh, activities. It's just part of it, okay? Both of those are important because it will guide us. The time really is an indicator of how much of the concentration we are allowed to have, the concentration of this material at, uh, at a time. So it will help us to know the maximum exposure concentrations. Okay. Of course, there are limitations to the use of exposure limits because we may not have accurate reading of concentrations. We may not have proper management and control over how much time our uh, workers spend at a time. However, it's a very useful guidance and it's used in several industries really. In this table that you see here, we have time-weighted average um, according to the, the exposure time. So we can see here if we have two hours, we have, um, if we compare it to the other uh, durations below, we have a, a relatively smaller number of concentration because we have more time. So if the time spent is going to be longer, then the concentration will need to be less. Okay? And of course the calculation is the concentration times the, the time, the number of hours spent, and that will give us the TWA or the time weighted average. Okay? Similarly, if we have one hour, it's the same procedure. But we, we need to pay attention to something here, as if we reduce the time, it does not mean automatically that, if we reduce the time to half, it doesn't mean that we can double the dose. It doesn't work like that. There is still a clear guidance that we need to follow because these numbers are not random. 
naturally. They are based on research and analysis of different cases and uh, victims that have been exposed to illnesses and, and uh, issues exposed uh, or resulted from exposure to these chemicals. So these numbers will need to be uh, followed uh, closely. Now in terms of control measures, um, we follow here typically the hierarchy of control measures. So we begin with eliminating or substituting um, the substance or the form of the substance. An example of that is asbestos. Because it has been uh, proven to be carcinogenic and there had been, and still there are many victims of uh, exposure to this chemical, it has now been banned all around the world. Sometimes if, if we have the luxury or the technology, we can change the process. Uh, so we reduce the exposure of workers, we can automate the process. And in this case, we don't have workers exposed to this chemical in any way. We reduce the time of exposure through job rotation, for example. We can segregate people from the hazard through enclosures and engineering controls and proper layouts. We can also use local exhaust ventilations, and this is one of the most like cost-effective solutions that you can find um, in different industries. It's not challenging nowadays with all the technology and engineering advancements to have a proper local exhaust uh, ventilation system in place. That is the effect of that really is to reduce concentration and therefore reduce the risk of uh, developing any illnesses. We can use dilution ventilation if we have a gas that we want to reduce the concentration of, so we pump in another material. We can use res respiratory protective equipment or RPE. We can use other PPE to protect the skin, the eyes. Personal hygiene, so providing showers and wash stations uh, around the site in order to uh, reduce the concentration of this material on the skin as much as possible, also providing vaccinations, especially for workers in the healthcare um, sector and also health surveillance and biological monitoring to, be, to have some kind of a proactive measurement uh, in place to measure, for example, concentration of a certain hazardous chemical in, in blood. If we look at uh, uh, local exhaust ventilation systems, we have two types. We have the general type, which you find really in most uh, places now to, to ventilate a room or an area. You will have ducts, you'll have different openings. But the type that we want to focus on here really is, and is the type that is most useful to deal with dust or um, vapor or any kind of chemical really that uh, can be experienced in the workplace. So the local type is more common in, in industries with high risk of hazardous materials. And the parts include the hood or the, the, the opening, okay, where the particles or the hazardous material will be sucked from the environment. There is ductwork or pipes. We expect to have filters to clarify the air before it goes out into the environment. And we'll, ha we'll need to have fans. Now, there are design uh, issues we need to take into account. So the size and the speed of the fans, the location of the hood, the ductwork needs to be um, cleaned and maintained. Same with filters as well on a regular basis. Otherwise, we're jeopardizing really the effectiveness of this uh, system. So unless we have a very good system to inspect and maintain the ventilation system, we are really, there's really no point of using it. And that's where a lot of organizations fail, especially with cleaning and replacing filters after a while. A good example of um, control measures is personal protective equipment. And I say good example, I don't mean that it's the most effective control or the, the most effective solution, but it's a common one. We need to keep in mind with personal protective equipment that they are not a control measure in their own right. It's unacceptable that we rely completely on personal protective equipment to mitigate chemical hazards, especially with chemicals. Because these are the last barrier, the last line of protection between the agent, the harmful agent, and the worker. And if that fails, which is very likely that it will fail, by the way, then we are risking the life and, and the health of, of this individual, and that's not acceptable. So we need to have another supplementary control measure in place in addition to PPE. It cannot be the only solution. And in the picture, here you see different examples. You see boots, you see face shields, gloves, 
uh, we see masks with filters, hearing protection, uh, safety goggles and helmets, all of these, there's sometimes aprons, there's sometimes watertight um, or uh, waterproof uh, coveralls. These are all different solutions that we can have uh, in place. As I mentioned with limitations is PPE fails to danger, so it only protects the wearer if they actually decide to wear it and if they know how to wear it properly. If it fits, sometimes it doesn't fit, it's uncomfortable. People are in different sizes and, other, and a lot of times we, there's a struggle of finding the right fit with um, personal protective equipment. It wears out after a while, it needs storage, so it's an additional cost really to the organization. As we mentioned, we can have protective clothing or equipment or hearing and respiratory protection. And here we have in the picture, you can see different types of respirators and a breathing apparatus, a BA. This is required when you have a toxic uh, gas like H2S, for example, because it's very likely to be present in oil and gas sites or operations. Uh, every single person who is visiting or working in such uh, locations is required to be trained and needs, they need to be familiar on how to use a breathing apparatus in case of emergency. Similarly here we see glasses and eye shields and face shields, we see goggles as well to prevent from splashing of uh, harmful chemicals. Okay. You can see as well here armlets and gloves of different shapes and types. Moving on to health surveillance, we brushed upon health surveillance briefly in the uh, previous slides, but the, the types or methods of health surveillance can include medical examination, which is a legal requirement um, in, in most parts of the world before and during employment on a regular basis, health questionnaires, biological monitoring, for example, taking urine or blood samples to measure the concentration of a certain agent, lung function tests and audiometry to check for um, loss uh, of, of hearing, for example. And the types, so these tests can happen before employment, they can happen on a periodic basis, and this period will depend on what kind of work uh, we have these people doing and the level of risk they are exposed to it. So in some industries or some sites, this, these tests are done on a monthly basis, in others it's done after like every two years or so. It depends on the age on the in, of the individual, if they have any pre-existing medical conditions as well. Sometimes there is post-sickness examination before, again, to check the, the fitness of this individual um, before they return to work. Now, moving on to some specific agents uh, which we want to give attention to because they are common and because they are really risky. So we start with asbestos. Again, with asbestos, they are present in lagging uh, heating systems and it's used in fire protection. Now, if you read about the history of asbestos, it has been widely used um, after, let's say, World War II. There were a lot of attempts to rebuild and to go back into operation and start the industry going again. And they have used this material without studying it properly, without proper risk assessment. And as a result, a decade or two later, so beginning of 70s and 80s, we start to see uh, a lot of cases of uh, lung cancer of different types. And when those were investigated, it was found that asbestos was the reason behind it. So it was categorized as carcinogenic. And as a result, it has now been banned all around the world. Um, unfortunately, it is still there in some older buildings, in um, uh, heating systems, for example. But there had been very strict st uh, standards and regulations on how to handle this material properly. Of course, the route of entry is through inhalation. So it's, it's like a fiber, very fine fiber that can be breathed in and it will settle into the lung. It will turn into a fibrosis or tumor and after a while it will turn into um, a carcinogenic really or a, a cancer. Um, of course, it causes asbestosis, lung cancer, and mesothelioma. These are the most common types of uh, diseases um, associated with it. We also have different types of dust, like silica, lead, wood, and cement. Most of those are used in construction, in fitting, and refurbishment. 
Um, and with um, uh, respirable dust, the, the issue with that is that they are small enough to go into the deep lungs, so they settle into the lungs. Um, sometimes we, we come across inhalable dust, so it is breathed in, but it's caught in the nose and the throat. Of course, each organ where these, this dust is settled, it will cause a different kind of harm or disease. Um, of course, dust can be uh, monitored in, the, in those cases using uh, sampling pumps, so it's collected on a filter and, weigh, and weighed just to kind of evaluate the level of exposure. Electronic uh, instruments, there's dust lamps as well to measure the thickness or the, the, the weight again of the, of the dust settling on top of that surface. Moving on to very common um, hazardous gases, which is carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. Uh, it's an, uh, carbon dioxide is an asphyxiant, so it causes um, suffocation in high concentrations. Uh, and it, it's a harmful uh, chemical. It, it's uh, irritating, especially for those with uh, respiratory allergies or asthma. Now, with carbon monoxide, it causes carbohemoglobin. So basically, again, it causes different cause or uh, case of asphyxiation. Uh, it causes headaches, dizziness, confusion, disorientation, and fainting, coma, and death as a result. And a lot of the, f the deaths associated with uh, fires, the cause for those usually is carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. Okay, so approximately, if you look at statistics of uh, victims of um, fires, Almost half of the victims die from asphyxiation. It's not actually burning that causes the bigger number of, uh, of, lo of human loss. And finally, we move on into biological agents. Okay, so forms of biological agents can be bacteria, they can be viruses, and they can be fungi. They could also be internal parasites or they can be transferred through insects, if insects were present in that uh, area. Now, industries or um, employees at a higher risk of biological agents include those working in farms, working in laboratories, dealing with blood samples, for example, or body fluids, health service uh, providers, waste disposal exposed to such um, agents, and also, of course, sewage workers. We can, you can expect really all kinds of harmful uh, chemicals and biological agents to be there. So they are at a much, much higher risk, this uh, category. Now, with Leptospira, it is responsible for whale's disease. And this happens when we have workers working in or near water where rats may live. Sewage workers are at a higher risk. Of course, the bacteria can be ingested or absorbed through cuts. So that highlights how important it is to have uh, protective clothing for workers in such uh, circumstances. The symptoms are fever, high temperature, headaches, vomiting, and muscle pain. If the person has not received proper medical care, it can eventually lead to even a fatality. Now moving on to another example of diseases caused by biological agents, which is Legionnaire's disease. And this kind of disease occurs with air conditioning systems and showers where there is uh, improper circulation and temperature control. Uh, and this happens usually dur during the inhalation of fine water droplets contaminated with this uh, kind of agent. And usually this also occurs or the risk is higher if the water is kept at a te temperature between 20 to 40 degrees Celsius. As a control measure, what we can do is begin with temperature control. So we have the water being above 60 degrees Celsius. In that case, the bacteria causing these kind of, uh, these kind of symptoms or this disease will not live uh, and therefore we eliminate any chance of uh, contacting uh, this disease. We avoid stagnation, so we always ensure that the water is being in, in circulation on a regular basis, keep the systems clean. A lot of the times, of course, in, in the water dry systems, they use chlorine uh, as a protective measure. And also water treatment programs. Um, another common example of uh, diseases called, uh, caused by uh, harmful agents is hepatitis. Of course, there are different types of uh, hepatitis or inflammation of the liver. That's what, what it actually means. 
and usually it is caused by infectious virus or a toxic chemical agent so exposure to toxic chemicals can also cause this uh, disease of course there are uh, two categories there is hepatitis A which happens due to um, contact with um, polluted uh, food for example contaminated food uh, and this usually happens when there is poor sanitary conditions. Um, you can expect to to uh, to have people exposed to such a disease. And then there is also hepatitis B, C, and D. And this uh, happens through uh, contact between humans, or um, can also develop as a result to, as we mentioned, exposure to uh, to toxins. A good control is to have good personal hygiene and vaccination in place. Having proper welfare facilities in place is key, especially in the workplace. And recovery is normally complete in one or two weeks. Of course, uh, the, the second type, which is hepatitis B, hepatitis B, C, and D, take much longer and they may require a bit more of um, medication and recovery period. Moving on to a tetanus, which is the, a bacterial toxin that affects the brain and nervous system. It leads to stiffness in the muscles and it enters the body through cuts and scratches. So uh, a certain type of bacteria that grows on surfaces. And if we have a sharp object, let's say um, a needle, okay, and someone steps on that needle or it enters into the body and it's polluted or contaminated, with this bacteria, there is a risk of de developing uh, this disease. Of course, the best prevention for this is vaccination, which is um, available really and required in most parts of the world anyway nowadays. Uh, so, with hepatitis and HIV, there's a real risk from uh, needle stick injuries. Of course, the population or people at higher risk include health workers, hospital waste disposal workers, and of course, if you have um, um, victims of uh, drug abuse, for example, using uh, contaminated uh, injections on a uh, repeatedly, of course, is going to have a risk of uh, developing these diseases. Um, and that's why, especially with waste disposal and biological waste, there are usually special containers and, and bags with clear label in order to handle them in a proper way. And the workers as well usually are required to use a particular type of personal protective equipment to protect against any kind of uh, injury or illness from such agents. So that brings us to the end of this module. Thank you and I hope this was useful and beneficial.